Hey guys, Dylan from the Geek Duo here, and today I'll be bringing you my Ruby Volume 8 Chapter 9 Breakdown. Now, I am very aware that I didn't do a breakdown for last week's episode, the episode that started off the second half of this volume, and that is purely because of my three strike video system. Basically, if there are three different things that happen to my video outside of my control that stops me from getting it out on time, I just can the video. So with last week's breakdown, my OBS recording got corrupted, my editing software crashed, and then YouTube upload failed twice. And so I'm just like, okay, that's a sign not to put it out. Anyway, this chapter was another great episode. Personally, I'd say it's one of the best of the volumes so far, and would have been more appropriate as the returning episode than chapter 8. Like, yes, I know they didn't plan to have such a long hiatus, so they didn't think that it would be such a big thing when it returned, but there's also the fact that episode 8 and episode 9, all of the events that happen in both of those episodes are completely independent of each other. So they could have been switched in um, episode order and no one outside of the production team would have known. Also, I will be trying a different image sizing for this breakdown because I noticed in that some of the images look a little too small to be able to see the details I'm trying to point out with them. The chapter begins back on the front lines of the Atlas defenses or what remains of them as there are only a couple trenches with soldiers in them, six Atlesian paladins I think that was a couple of airships and the corpses of every other soldier that has left those trenches. And as the camera pans over both armies towards Monstrous Mouth, we get a better look at the newer Grim, these being the Arctic Ursas and the Sulphur Fish. But there are Megaliath bear wolves, winged beringals, and various aerial troops as well. It cuts to inside Monstra as Mantle Team runs through one of the corridors before stopping to catch their breath. They comment on how difficult it was just getting inside and how much more they still have to do in such a small time frame because they don't know when the bomb's going to land. In fact, when the bomb lands, they don't even get a message from the ASOFs. Like, you'd think that would have been common courtesy. Like, anyway, I'll get to that more when that happens. Before Ren tells them what happened on the ASOF ship, how he can now sense spikes in people's emotions, and that if he focuses his aura, he can actually find the direction from which those emotions are coming. Though he can't pick out whose emotions they are yet. He says that all of the emotions in the whales are located closely together. And we know of four people that would be producing emotions on the whale. That being Hazel, Emerald, Oscar and Neo. Salem I don't think she'd be able to be picked up by Ren's semblance. He starts to walk away, but Jean puts a hand on his shoulder and offers him his assistance, to which Ren shyly thanks him. This part ends with proof that Jean has been hanging around Yang too much because he awkwardly finger guns at Ren and Yang just rolls her eyes in the background. I did say after episode 7 that 
now that Ren's semblance has worked itself out, we should be getting the old Ren back, and it seems as though this is the case from ju not just this scene, but also the scenes later in the episode as well. In fact, we might even get a more emotionally open Ren than what we had at the start. We then head into Oscar's cell as he's lying on the ground reciting a fairy tale to himself, which Ozpin calls the girl who fell through the world. Now, this isn't actually in the Fairy Tales of Remnant book, so maybe there's going to be a sequel one. Who knows? I'd be happy to read through more Remnant Fairy Tales. Oscar comments on how he shouldn't be surprised that Ozpin knew the story, and Oz replies that he's lived through several fairy tales in his lifetime. We then get a little more information about the story through Oscar, huh? saying how he now understands the girl better because he used to be confused why she was so sad upon returning home, but she wasn't the girl that she was when she left. Now, when I first heard all this, I thought it was an Alice in Wonderland reference, and I even said this in my reaction, but as I thought on it more, I realized, yeah, this could also be read as a Wizard of Oz reference as well, because they do have similar themes, so could be either, could be both, don't know yet. Anyway, Oz and Oscar agree that there isn't much more they can do in their plan to divide Salem's forces, so they should probably think of a way to escape now. Oz suggests that, why don't we use magic? But Oscar, he shuts the idea down saying, every time we use magic, I can feel our souls merging more and more. I'm not ready for this. Oz accepts this, and he's just like, I'm actually impressed on how well you've been handling this on your own. But before they can talk more, Hazel walks into the room and grabs Oscar. We jump back to the front lines where we see Winter giving orders to a troop of soldiers in one of the trenches. And among these soldiers are a few familiar faces. Team Funky are lined up with the soldiers and they're wearing the military armor. Albeit they're not wearing their helmets because, well, how would we be able to recognize them if we can't see their faces? And also Neon is wearing her skates, but that's out of necessity. Winter tells them that they need to keep this elderly clear until the payload arrives, otherwise they'll lose the city to the Grim and then sends them all up over the walls, which if you think back to World War One, World War Two, when people were sent out of the trenches in to cross no man's land, more often than not, they all died, which is what looks to be what happens with the um, generic Atlas soldiers that run out. Marrow stares at where Team Funky was appalled that Atlas was sending children to fight on the front lines, but Elm tells him to deal with it later and to just kill Grimm. We then jump back inside the whale and get the shot from the trailer of Hazel opening a door, which I correctly guessed would be the room to where the lamp was being held. Oscar asks Hazel why he brought him there and Hazel says that either you were lying about the password, in which case, if I tell Salem the wrong password, I'm going to be the one punished, not you. And I don't know what happens when this activates. This could be a trap for all I know, so why don't you activate it? This is the point where Emerald reveals herself to also be in the room, having walked in behind them without either of them noticing. And Hazel just 
stands next to her protectively and tells Oscar to get on with it. Now, I did predict that these three would be in the room where the relic was activated and that Oscar would be the one to activate it, but sadly I also said that Mantle Team would be there, so I can only give myself one and a half points for these two predictions. Oscar calls on Jin and he gives a little cute wave smile combo when she addresses him. Hazel tells her that all of his questions have been answered now. He says that he's going to do what Gretchen would have done, starting with getting Oscar and Emerald, who when Jin started swelling out of the lamp, Hazel put his arm out to shield Emerald with. So he is very much playing the protective older brother, almost dad or uncle figure to Emerald, and was Mercury as well. So, while he couldn't have been there to protect Gretchen, he sure as hell is going to protect this teenage girl. Oscar tells Hazel that he's going to need something before they leave, but before he can elaborate on what he needs, he's interrupted by Jin, and she's double checking that none of you have a question for me? Which I picked up as interesting because remember in the volume 6 finale when Ruby summoned Jin and it was only because she needed time to activate her silver eyes properly. Jin knew outright that Ruby didn't have a question for her before she was even summoned and she was also very annoyed that she was being used in this way saying she would not allow herself to be used without a question. Now fast forward two volumes, she thinks that someone there has a question for her, even though they've said they don't, and she's curious, not annoyed. Which we do get somewhat of an answer to, but not until the end of this section. Oscar says to her that, while they may not have a question for her, they will be taking her with them. But Hazel informs him that if the relic were to be moved, the whole whale will go onto high alert. So he'll come back once he's gotten Oscar and Emerald off the whale. The three of them walk out of the room and Jin watches them go before she returns to the lamp but not before looking to the right of the door with a hmm. We see why this is a couple seconds later when a pair of pink and brown eyes open from the wall before a piece of the wall steps out and starts walking towards the lamp, shifting to a look that we're more familiar with. We jump back to Mantle Team as they're still making their way through the whale. And we see that Jean's aura has nearly completely drained from it constantly being channeled into Ren and both auras being used to mask them from the Grim and track their emotions. This is the first time we've actually seen Jean's semblance falter while he's using it. And while it's not to the extent that his aura is broken, it's just that there's not enough in the tank for him to actually the pump into Ren anymore. Jean tries to lean on the wall to catch his breath, but his hand just slips down in the goop and he suggests that, how about we give masking emotions a break? Just point me in the direction we're going. I'll scout out ahead and come back if there's any trouble. Yang says that at least those two uh, were able to rekindle their friendship in the face of impending doom and Ren, who's not quite done exposing everyone he sees, tells Yang that you don't need to mask your fear with jokes. It, I'm scared too. But Jean? 
there's not an ounce of fear in him. He truly believes that we're going to get this done. Which is very funny considering it's immediately followed by Jean running back and telling them that they need to hide. Ren masks their emotions again and we see what Jean was running from. It was a seer, which we've still never actually seen someone successfully fight. It starts floating past them, making it past the little offshoot of the corridor that they're hiding in, but before it's out of range, Ren's aura breaks, and so the seer, it turns to notice them. Next up, we're back to the villain's POV, as Emerald and Hazel are walking down a corridor, and as they reach a dip in the path, they spot Salem approaching from the other direction. Now, the two, both of these in this scene reminded me very much of this don't be suspicious don't be suspicious oh, don't be suspicious don't be suspicious don't be suspicious anyway salem asks hazel if he's managed to get the password from oscar yet and hazel can't seem to figure out how to answer her as he knows that she has an uncanny ability to tell when someone is lying to her and he looks scared at the fact. He starts stammering, trying to think of what to say, but luckily for him, Salem gets an alert from the seer that spotted Mantle Team. Emerald and Hazel exchange a look when they find out there are others in the whale, and Salem starts walking away back the way she came before she stops again whips around to Hazel and Emerald, telling them to go find the intruders as she glides off very quickly towards the lamp room. Back with Mantle Team, we see them easily dispatch of a small pack of sabers before Ren asks what they should do now. Since he no longer has any aura, so he can't actually track emotions anymore, and Jean's aura is too depleted to recharge his. Yang suggests that they do what they do best. Charge blindly into danger. Though Jean comments that he would have phrased it as them keep moving forward. As they all ready their weapons and run further into the whale. We cut back to the front lines as Elm's rockets explode two mega lives, and Vine uses his semblance to cut through some sabers. We get a nice little team attack from Flint and Neo, where Flint uses his quartet to ground a sphinx, and Neo skates in to attack it with her glow chucks. We then see Marrow take out a saber with his boomerang, before freezing a flying Berengal, and Harriet jumping up and punching it. She asks Winter how much longer they have to hold off for the payload, and Winter tells them that it's arriving now. The ship carrying the bomb lands, and Marrow begs his good friend Juan to get out of there. Yes, despite them growing close over the course of several weeks, Marrow never actually learned how to pronounce Jean's name correctly. There's a shot of Monstra opening her mouth to release another wave and then we're back inside as mental team is running through the corridors before coming to a sudden stop as they round a corner the camera moves over to show that they've run face to face with emerald and hazel but as the kids ready their weapons hazel jumps forward and says wait 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 the illusion drops to reveal that Haze, the Hazel travelling with Emerald is actually Oscar and has been since they left the relic room. So that means that A. Emerald has been holding this illusion 
the entire time they were moving. B, her illusion now works as an AOE thing, not just focused on one mind. And C, Emerald was able to trick Salem with her illusions. Jean drops his weapons and runs over to pick Oscar up in a big hug, probably misplacing a few of the broken bones, leading to this nice scene of the full team orgy, before Emerald makes a comment about having sensed weak minds nearby. Yang demands to know what's going on and why they should trust Emerald, but Ren says that she's scared, like we are. Emerald just brushes this off with, or maybe I just know the quickest way out. Back to the front lines and the ship carrying the bomb opens and Winter walks on board before turning and addressing the reinforcements, telling them that they need to clear a path to Monstra so that the Aesops can plant the bomb, set the timer, and then get out. Now, I think that this timing device is going to fail. It's either going to get damaged in them trying to get it on the whale, or it's just n never would have been active to begin with, leading to the death of one person. And I think the most likely candidate for this would be Marrow, who uses his semblance to stop the bomb just as it starts exploding, because we know that he can stop things that are inanimate and everything, because he managed to stop two sentinels that were floating in midair, stop Penny and her thruster fire, and stop a winged Berengal midair. So he could very easily stop a explosion. But the problem is, he can't move when his semblance is activated. Because if he loses line of sight with the thing he's stopping, or even so much as changes direction slightly, his semblance stops. Also, he can't use it for very long, so there's not really much time for someone to take him out while he's also stopping the bomb. However, there is one person who could, and I think that if Rooster Teeth, if any of the people who are working on writing the show has seen the show Heroes, they might actually go for this route because in that show, spoilers, there's a speedster character named Daphne, who in one episode is near a nuclear explosion and she runs from basically the blast zone all the way across America and she dies at the front of Parkman's apartment and we see that her entire back had been burnt and because she didn't get out of the explosion quick enough but she was able to complete her goal. So what if Harriet fills basically the same role, rushing in to save Marrow and taking him out, but in, the, in doing so, she dies from the explosion. I reckon that would be a very emotion heavy scene because it's the one Aesop who's been saying that you shouldn't sacrifice your life to save someone else's just doing the, that exact thing. Maro tries to get Winter to give Mantle team more time, asking her if she would still make that call if it was Weiss in there. Is she going to be the one to call Weiss and tell her that she blew up her friends? And Winter replies with yes, because as much as it pains her to do so, this isn't a matter of Ironwood versus Ruby, of Gook, well, military versus 
Huntsman. This is a matter of the lives of four people who, for all they know, could already be dead versus an entire city. And, well, not just one city, the city below as well. It makes logical sense for them to explode it as quickly as possible. And back to the kids now, and they've managed to reach the rib docks on the port side. So I was incorrect in thinking they were only on one side of the whale. Though I don't need, know why Salem would need like 10 docks when she has like two airships. But before they could run down one of the docks and jump onto Atlas, Salem bursts through the wall, knocking everyone but Emerald to the floor. She instantly notices that Oscar is there and realizes that the hazel walking with Emerald earlier was Oscar as well. So she lunges forward and grabs Emerald. Now, I mentioned this in my reaction, but when Salem grabs Emerald, she actually is able to extend her limbs outward. And this allowed her to actually grab Emerald before her body even made it there. She comments that Emerald really has honed her semblance, but she doesn't get to say anything else because Team Orgy really doesn't hesitate to try and save Emerald from Salem. Ren shoots at her, but his bullets don't do anything. Well, more than annoy her. So she spins around and then shoots a beam of magic at him, which Jean is able to block with his shield. I don't know why this surprised me so much, but I still reckon there is something more with this sword and shield given that it's been passed down his family for so long. But yeah, it was able to block Salem's magic, though the two boys did get slammed into the wall and Jean's aura did break. While Salem is distracted by doing this, Yang takes the opportunity to jump in and plant several bombs on Salem's chest before sliding away and then exploding them. But this doesn't stop Salem at all. Sure, it creates a hole in Salem's chest as Grimgoop flies up and then freezes, but Salem just twists her arm out and shoots some form of Grim goop that is able to stick to both of Yang's gauntlets. She reels Yang back in and then grabs her robotic arm. Before Oscar, he shoots a beam of magic at Salem. And while Salem's was multicolored, his is purely green. I'm not sure if this is stylistic or it's because of how little magic Oscar actually has. This beam actually damages Salem enough to drop her to her knees, but it doesn't do much more than that. And Salem, in retaliation, just throws Yang at Oscar, which was very funny. She summons up the grim hands from the floor to hold Team Orgy down and then sticks Emerald to the wall with them as well, before bringing a ball of magic into her hand and demanding that Emerald tell her where they took the relic. Emerald is genuinely confused with this, and Salem believes her, so she goes to ask Oscar instead. She calmly walks over to him, talking tenderly before grabbing his head and demanding to know why he keeps coming back. But Yang turns this question back on Salem, 
asking her why does she come back? It's now Yang's turn to call someone out on their shit, saying that all of this death and destruction is because one bad thing happened to you way back? Newsflash, not many people get a happy ending. And that everything that Yang has lost, every one that Yang has lost, has been because of Salem. Salem walks over to Yang and she's just like, and who exactly have I taken from you? To which Yang replies, Summer Rose, my mother. This intrigues Salem and she bends down like, her again? But before she can either crush Yang's spirit with knowledge or taunting about Summer's death, or revealing something that someone may be alive, Hazel walks onto the scene. Before I go on, I do want to note that Salem definitely knows Summer personally. Like, they met face to face. Both in what she said to Ruby last volume, in that Summer said the exact words to her, and she knew that Ruby was Summer's daughter when she first saw them. Yet she didn't know of Yang's relationship to Nor to Summer. Maybe she just keeps note on Silver-Eyed Warriors and their offspring. Like, I think that's more likely. Salem tells Hazel to take Oscar back to his cell while she deals with the traitorous Emerald. And Hazel actually looks as though he's going to comply with Salem's order, as he walks past Emerald with little more than a look and picks Oscar up. But it's quickly revealed that this is just a facade in order to hand Oscar his cane and say, no more Gretchen's boy. Now, Salem, she's about to touch Emerald with her um, concentrated ball of magic and we saw just how much pain that caused Oscar when being fired across a room so imagine how much pain it would cause just shoved into your face but she doesn't get the opportunity to do this because all of a sudden Hazel said punching her square in the face and with enough force to send her two docks over. Salem lands in a wind funnel, focusing all her attention on Hazel, which causes the grim arms that were holding Team Orgy and Emerald to disappear. Hazel, he rips his shirt off again and then stabs five different dust crystals into his shoulders and these are fire, wind, earth, lightning and hard light. Though in my reaction I thought it was ice dust not hard light. Anyway we see that Having this much raw dust in his body is already doing a lot of damage because it instantly causes his veins to glow. He even sprouts a couple rocks from his shoulder and his eyes are also glowing and look like almost like he's got black eyes already before he's even been hit by anything. So it is obviously doing him damage internally. He gives Emerald one last smile while she shakes her head tell, trying to tell him don't, don't give your life away for this. But he just turns back to Salem. Salem tries to start with a low blow mentioning that oh you're deciding against vengeance for your sister after all this time? 
But Hazel expected this, and he says, he's doing what Gretchen would have done. He does a boxing move where, after, before they start a fight, how they're shaking their arms, but when he does it and brings his arms back up, we see that he's actually ignited his knuckles using the fire dust. He charges towards her, dodging several magic blasts from her, then distracts her with a few fireballs long enough for him to think of his next attack. He changes direction, grabbing several dust crystals from his pouches, using a wind one to launch himself up into the air, and then smashing several together, combining it with the dust that's already in his body to create a massive um, spiked rock ball that he slams down on top of Salem. This knocks her to the ground, and he lands on her by slamming his fist directly into her stomach, then punching her in the face so hard that Liquid Grim flies out and paints the ground to almost look like there are dark wings around her. But Salem takes this moment to basically confirm what I thought when we heard how her and Hazel first met, and that is that she let Hazel kill him, kill her, because even though her face is caved in, like she's got a massive hole in her head, she's still 100% functioning and uses grim hands to actually lift Hazel up into the air and hold him so he can't even move. The kids see Hazel get lifted like this and decide that this is the perfect opportunity for them to actually get out of there. But as Jean is directing everyone off the dock, he notices that Oscar is standing there, cane in hand still. He tries to get Oscar to leave with them, but Oscar just says, she'll only follow us before extending the cane and looking determinedly at Salem. Salem, at this moment, is still trying to attack Hazel while she's on the ground, shooting magic up at him, but he uses the hard light in his system to create a barrier. And Salem responds by just getting rid of three of the arms and using the fourth one to swing him around and throw him into the wall. Quickly running over, grabbing his head and then slamming it into the ground a few times until she notices that Oscar is using one of the cane's abilities. We don't actually know what this ability is. All we know is it's creating yellow and green particles. So Salem, ignoring Hazel from this point on, charges towards Oscar, but is caught by Hazel, who wraps his arms around her and lifts her up off the ground. She tries to make him let go of her by creating grim hands to choke him out, but he was obviously expecting this because he has a fire dust crystal in his mouth that he bites down on and ignites both him and Salem before looking at Oscar and saying, do it. Oscar activates his magic shielding again and then fires a beam of magic at the two of them. And then the beam of magic turns the whole screen white and then it fades to black. And that is how this episode ends. Now, I'm sure you can all see why I personally think that this would have been a stronger opening for the second half than the Shnee Manor one was, but I can also see that they wanted to return it on Ruby because she is the main main character. Anyway, there are 
A couple things I want to see or hear about in the next few episodes and most of them are in relation to Neo trying to activate Jin because she can't talk. She can't seem to make any noise at all and even if she knows sign language I don't think that Jin inside her bottle would be able to read the signs so how is Neo going to open the lamp? What's her main objective? Is she going to use the question for herself or take the um, lamp to someone else? Because she doesn't actually have any loyalty to anyone in Atlas. Like, she definitely doesn't have any loyalty to Ruby and the heroes. And she has no loyalty to Salem in that. The only reason she's there is a tense alliance with Cinder that if she um, opens Jin and Jin says that Cinder's responsible for Roman's death, that alliance is out the window and Nia's going to stab Cinder. So who knows what she's going to do? I did have this one idea considering that the Roman numeral theory is still in place. She may ask Jin, well, find a way to ask Jin, who should she blame for Roman's death? And Jin will respond with, I can't answer questions about events that have yet to happen. Revealing that Tortwick is still alive. And that's one of the ways that the Roman numeral theory could come to fruition. Anyway, any other questions that may have arisen from this episode are more than likely going to happen and be revealed in either the next episode or any of the four after that. Not four. Yeah, the four after that. So. With that being said, I hope you enjoyed it and I'll catch you in the next one.